just stay there because ultimately he's going to treat us right. Now, I don't know about Cloyd. He was out for blood. But the Lord, we can trust him. If we just hang on and stay with him, he understands where he's going. He understands what he's doing. And ultimately, it's going to be good for us. And so we need to hang on with the Lord. So here's, here's where we're going tonight. Questionable times call for unquestionable faith in God. Questionable times call for unquestionable faith in God. Just where you, where you draw the line and you say, okay, Lord, I may not understand everything. I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going on, what you're doing, but I'm with you. I'm not going to quit on you. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to bail right now. I'm going to hang on and I'm going to go with you wherever you take me. Questionable times call for unquestionable faith in God. The question for us to answer tonight is this. How will I respond when I wonder, what is the purpose in this? Those times in life when I wonder and I ask myself and I ask the Lord, Lord, what's the purpose in all this? How will we respond? Tonight we'll see the rewards of embracing God's plan. Tonight we're going to look at this passage and we're going to read it in just a moment. We're going to do the whole chapter tonight. And we're going to see that there's a lot of factual information. Remember last week was the same way. A lot of facts, a lot of just info about what Paul is going through. And on the surface, maybe not a lot of spiritual application. I mean, you and I are probably not going to go to, to trial over, you know, things that we didn't do for our faith's sake. Probably not. But there's not, on the surface, a lot of spiritual application at the beginning. But I hope to draw, again, an overarching theme of when you don't know what God's doing, just stay with him. So I think we'll see that tonight. Let's look at the Word of God, Acts 24, beginning in verse 1. And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence, we accept it always, and in, good all, and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray, that, I pray thee that thou wouldst hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes who also hath gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee, by examining of whom thyself makest, uh, mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself, to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had aught against me. Or else let these same here say if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, Except it be for this one voice, that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. And when Felix heard these things, 
having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent him for the oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to shew the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Again, an interesting event in the life of Paul. So you'll recall, he was rescued by Lysias, the captain of the, the chief captain of the Roman soldiers, after he found the plot the Jews had to kill Paul. Remember, they had taken an oath. Forty of them said that we're not going to eat or drink until we kill Paul. Well, when that didn't work out their way because Lysias, the captain, secured Paul and overnight took him to Caesarea to keep him safe, Paul was now there uh, with the Romans there, and he was before Felix. And as he's before Felix, after five days, the Bible says, picking up in chapter 24, that the high priest Ananias and the elders all descended with him to Caesarea. And they brought with them a certain orator named Tertullus. So the first thing we notice in this passage, all the way down to verse 9, is the libel of the Jews. They bring slander and lies against Paul. And when they bring them, they don't just uh, show up and send, send some uh, lackey to go and tell the, the knowledge. Have fun interpreting that one. Uh, lackey. Uh, when they sent the lackey to go take, they didn't do that. What they did was the high priest and the elders, probably arrayed in all of their priestly apparel, descended. Now we know that that's topographical because Jerusalem was built up and so they had to descend to go there, but also in their mind they descended as the Pharisees often did. They descended to Caesarea with a man named Tertullus who was an orator. Now it's supposed that he was a Hellenistic Jew, meaning he was a Greek, because the Greeks like to do what? Talk. They like to uh, do philosophy. They're very philosophical uh, in their approach. And so they just like to talk about anything, anything and everything. It doesn't matter if it, does, if it makes sense or not. They just like to talk. And so they, they like to do this, and they bring this orator. He's very good with words. And they bring him to state their case before Felix. And when he comes, the first thing we notice he does is he starts with flattery. He starts talking about how wonderful Felix is. is and because of him, uh, they have shown such providence to the people. And, of course, they're trying to build up Felix. They call him, in verse 3, most noble Felix. And then he says, would you rather grant us your clemency? You know, just really pouring it on thick. Well, Felix had been around the block a few times. This wasn't his first rodeo, so to speak. And so he knew how to handle flattery. And so he decides to just go ahead and, hey, cut to the chase. Let's get to it. Well, Tartullus begins to talk. And as he begins, he levels some charges against Paul. Let's notice those charges. The first thing he says in verse 5, We have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition. A pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition. Uh, This guy, they say, caused all kinds of, of problems. He's a mover of sedition. He gets people together and he causes riots and ruckuses everywhere he goes. He doesn't go anywhere peacefully. When he goes to the temple, or when he's among anybody, when he preaches this Nazarene, he stirs up trouble. That's the first charge he lays against Paul. He's pestilent, and he's a mover of sedition. He's a rioter. The second thing he says in verse 5, he's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He wouldn't even say Jesus' name. He says, a a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. You know, those people that followed that Nazarene, he's the ringleader. Ringleader is only good in one context, and that's when you're watching a circus. 
Uh, usually when you hear that somebody's a ringleader, that's a negative context. Well, these are the boys that cause trouble, and that one there's the ringleader. You know what I'm saying, don't you? How many of you have been the ringleader before? Raise your hand. All right, yeah, we all have, okay? I've been a ringleader, and I've never worked in the circus, all right? And, uh, but we've all been a ringleader, but you know how those people are. Everybody seems to be stirred up, and there's this one guy sitting there calmly in the middle of them. Be careful, because that's usually the ringleader. He's the one that gets everybody wound tight. Well, he calls Paul the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. And that word sect there has something to do with the word heresy. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, who also hath gone about to profane the temple. Now to the Romans, this means nothing. They don't care. Who cares if he profaned your temple? They don't, they don't go for that. But that was another charge they leveled. He profaned the temple. And then he goes on and he says this, and by the way, Felix, we were going to handle this problem of yours, this Paul, he's your problem now. We were going to handle him, but Lysias, the captain, he came and with great violence took him from us. Well, the interesting part, if you'll recall, is Lysias did come, and he did bring a lot of people with him, but there wasn't any violence. They were going to stand up to the Romans, and he actually did take him, and even overnight in a peaceful manner, made sure he got to Caesarea. But Lysias came and he did his job, but they said with great violence. In other words, they're saying, listen to this guy. He used excessive force to stop us. You ever heard that? Yeah. Well, he's laying it on thick. And, and think about this, too. He says, we would have handled him ourselves. What was their way of handling him? They're going to kill him. There was no trial. They're going to murder him. That was their plan. So he comes, Tertullus, this orator, and all these fine words, and, and uses the best uh, strategies for, for legal you know, examination, and just gives the best he can to lay it on thick for Felix. And when he, when he finishes his speech there in verse 8, the Bible records in verse 9, and the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. All the other people that came with him said, yep, that's how it happened. So in other words, they all, again, conspired together to lie about Paul. Well, Felix is listening on, and then it says in verse 10 that Paul, after the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, so Felix says, all right, Paul, it's your turn. Let's hear your side of the story. And then Paul gives his side of the story. From verses 10 to 21, we hear the honesty of Paul. He just cuts it how it was. And beginning in verse 10, he says, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. No flattery there. He makes a statement. I know how long you've been doing this, and so I'm glad to tell you my side of the story because a man that's been in, the, uh, in a judgment scene as long as you have, he understands there's always two sides to every story. That's all Paul says there. So I know you're going to give me a fair speech. So he goes on to verse 11. Because that thou mayest understand, what's his goal? His goal is to get Felix to understand what happened, not just to throw a bunch of words out there that have zero depth to them, or zero truth to them. He says, I want you to understand what happened. I like that. He says, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. He says, this just happened not even two weeks ago. And I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Verse 12, and here he goes. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither rising up the, raising up the people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. And in just a few verses of scripture, and a few sentences, Paul says, everything he's just said, there's zero proof. Tertullus can talk a big talk, but when the judge asks for evidence, his answer, I don't have any. Well, Paul says, they can't prove a thing that they've said about me. I was there, but I didn't do the things they said. Paul levels the truth. He's honest. And he called out the man who was brought in to do a bunch of empty talk. And then Paul does confess one thing. Don't you love his choice of words? Now remember, he's before a governor who's going to possibly hand out a sentence. And he says this, but this I confess unto you. And I like this because 
that probably everybody leaned forward in their chairs, right? Oh, what's he going to say? What did he do? What, what's, his, what's his crime? What is he about to confess? Well, verse 14, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And the first thing he says to them is, they're right. I do worship the God that they say I worship. And I believe everything that's written in the law and the prophets. Every word of it. And there's a verse right there for the people who don't believe that all the Bible is true. There's a verse for all the people who say, well, you know, some of that Jonah and the whale, come on. A whale isn't really going to swallow a guy. Um, come on. Three people in a furnace. The people who threw him in died, but they, you know, they didn't even smell like smoke. I mean, I think God was just using that as allegory. God couldn't have possibly meant that that really happened. There's no way. Well, there's a verse for the people who say that. The Apostle Paul said, I believe all of the law and the prophets. Every bit of it. I believe it. That's his confession. I believe what's written. And I do worship th that God. And then in verse 15 he says, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Going back to this morning. He says, there's something that they'll even confess to you, at least part of them, the Pharisees. They'll confess that there is a resurrection. Not only is there a resurrection, but I know the one who has, is the resurrection. He says, I believe in that. And they'll even admit to you that that's true. In verse 16, and herein do I exercise myself. Here's where I labor. Here's where I strive for. To have always a conscience Void of offense toward God and toward men. That's pretty deep stuff right there. He says, this is what I work hard at. I work hard that I neither offend God or man. I, that, my goal is that I wouldn't offend my God or that I wouldn't cause anybody to stumble. <clears throat> that would be a, a good work for you and for me too to strive that we wouldn't offend our Father in heaven, offend our Savior Jesus Christ, and that we would not cause another to stumble. He worked hard at that, I said. He said, and remember the last time he said that, what happened? The high priest said, smack his mouth. Nobody can possibly say that and mean it. Well, this time the high priest didn't get a chance to say that because he was also under authority. And he says, I, 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 that's how I live for. That's what I work for. Verse 17, now after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me, something they left out, purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult. He said it was peaceful. I was there with four other men who took a vow. Remember, Paul paid for their vow. He paid for all their sacrifice. He said, I was there with four other men who took this vow. I was purified I did it the right way, and there's people that know that's the truth. And there was no riot, there was no tumult, we were peaceful. Verse 19, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. He says, uh, those Jews that found me in the temple, if they wanted to come here and tell you what they found, where are they? I don't see them, because that would be lying. He says, they're not here. Verse 20, or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council. He says, any of these people sitting in front of you, if I did something wrong, let them say it right now. But he pauses and he says, except for one thing. Do you remember when he stirred up the Pharisees and the Sadducees? He brought up the resurrection and he got the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, quibbling and, and arguing and fighting there as a distraction method. And he even says, look what Paul says, he says, this is the only wrong thing that I did. Verse 21, I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. He said, that's the only thing I would take back. And you know what he did there? It wasn't even really wrong. He just knew that it was kind of a, a cheap shot. He says, if there's anything I, could have, I would take back, that would be it. Nothing wrong. And so, Paul gives his side of the story. 
He gives the truth of the matter. And now we see in verses 22 through 27 the hesitation of Felix. Did you see that he's a deferring man? He defers a lot, doesn't he? He's, it doesn't seem like to me he wants to make a decision. Look at verse 22. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, you know what that means? It says that he listened to Paul... He had better knowledge. He had the full story about that way. Now remember, especially here in the book of Acts, when you see that phrase, that way or the way, that's what they referred to Christians as. It was the way, the people that follow that way, the people that follow the way. They didn't like to invoke the name of Jesus. As it did, does today, it stirred up controversy back then. So they would say, yeah, those are the people of that way. So Felix says, now that I've listened to you, I have more perfect knowledge. I'm better equipped to understand that way, the way of Jesus. And when he said that, he, more, he had more understanding. Look at this, verse 22. He deferred them. He put them off. And said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. He said, you know what, I'm not going to make a call right now. I want to hear Lysias' side of the story, and then I'll make a call. So in other words, no decision. Everybody go your own way. We're going to keep Paul here. We're going to keep, somebody, keep an eye on him, but I'm not going to decide in favor of either one. So he defers the decision. It's a foreshadow of what's to come in the next few verses. Verse 23, And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul, and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or to come unto him. So he says, this guy is not a troublemaker. He's not going to be somebody we have to keep an eye on. I want you to watch him, but you let anybody that wants to, any of his friends, any of his people, any of those other people of that way, if they want to come and, and be with him, you allow him. He's not a danger. So he was afforded that leniency, not really liberty, because he will, was still kept under house arrest, if you will. So he's being watched. Then in verse 24, the, 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 the plot thickens. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Something happened when Felix was listening to Paul. And that something was the Holy Spirit of God began to work on Felix. And he said, you know what, there's something about this guy. And there's something about a man who has that kind of faith and that kind of zeal for what he believes in. I want to hear what he has to say about that way. I want to hear what he would preach to me if I were one of the people that he preaches to. And so he and his wife, which by the way is his third wife, and the last wife that he had, he just didn't like her so he got rid of her. And he married this girl who, it turns out, she is a teenager when he marries her. This is kind of a, um, a shady character, if you will. Okay? So he takes this girl as his wife, and he brings her down to speak, or to hear Paul speak about the faith in Christ. This is an opportunity, by the way, that Paul would not have had had he not been imprisoned. So again, when we go back to our main thought, Staying with God. I, don't, I really don't understand what God's doing here, but I trust he's got something going on. Here's one of those little lights that comes on. The light bulb pops on. Oh, well now I get to speak to Governor Felix. I get to witness to Governor Felix and his wife. This is a great opportunity. Only afforded because Paul stayed with God and was imprisoned. So now he has this opportunity. What would he say? Would he tell Felix that he could have his best life now? No. No. Would he tell Felix that, you know, Felix, everything's okay. You know, you're a good guy. You've been around long enough. Figure out how to do some good things. You know, uh, you're, you're, a, you're an incredible governor. You're a good judge. I see what you got going on here. What would he say to him? Well, he preaches, and the Bible gives us the contents of his message. Verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. These were the three subjects, the three-point sermon that Paul gave Felix that day. The first one was righteousness. Remember, he knew his audience. He knew the kind of people he was speaking to. He knew that he was dealing with sinners 
who did not know Christ. He knew their past. He knew their background. He knew the kind of people they were. And so the first thing he talked about is righteousness, sinlessness, perfection, holiness, and the fact that there's only one who is, and that's God. And we're not comparing Felix to the other governors. We're not compa comparing Felix to crazy Herod. We're comparing Felix to Jesus. And there is no comparison. And then his next subject was temperance or self-control. And he started to talk to him about something that Felix had not done to this point. Being a governor, he could have anything he wanted, including a teenage wife and the leniency to just get rid of his, his previous wife. So he didn't understand self-control, but he was preached about self-control. And then, judgment. Could you see Paul perhaps saying, Felix, you will bow before Christ someday, either as your Savior or as the judge. He knew that he was told that someday there was going to be a judgment, and he could either be a child of God and a follower of Jesus, and willingly bow to him as Savior, or he could bow to him as judge, and what his future would be, the lake of fire, if he did not choose to change and trust Christ. So Paul preaches this. He reasons, the Bible says, with Felix of these things. And as Felix listening, I love how the Bible gives us his verbalist, if that's even a word, response. Look what it says there in verse 25. Felix trembled. First thing we know is not what he said, but what he did. He trembled. He was shaking, literally terrified over what he had just heard. And listen, if you've lived your whole life answering to no one, or maybe just Caesar as God on earth, and you did anything you wanted, had anything you wanted, and everybody did for you, and for the first time, somebody stands up and says, there's one that's holier than you, there's one that's better than you, and he wants you to get yourself right, and he wants to save you, and if you don't, there is a judgment to come. For the first time to hear that, that scared him. And the Holy Spirit of God is all over Felix. All over him. He's shaking. He's under such conviction. And then he responds verbally, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season I will call for thee and he has done he did the same thing that unfortunately thousands and probably millions of people have done throughout the ages and that said not now I might do it later not right now not right now he put it off he deferred the decision friend Salvation in Jesus Christ, salvation is not a decision to defer. It's time to choose to trust Christ. If you're here and you haven't trusted Jesus, quit deferring. Don't say, I'll do it next week. Do it tonight. And in another sense, as a believer, when Jesus is speaking to us about something he would have us to do in this service tonight, I know he's speaking to our hearts. Whatever the Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart about tonight, don't defer it till next Sunday. In fact, I wouldn't even defer it until you get home. If you're like me, when you get home, things go crazy. You're getting ready for school, you're making supper, you're, you know, you're getting ready for the night. All these things. Don't defer it. If God's dealing with you now, deal with it now. And finally, Felix sends him away and says, I'll call for you. He had hoped that Paul would try to bribe him, verse 26 says. He knew that Paul probably didn't have money, but he talked about offerings and alms, and he knew he knew people who had money. So he wanted a bribe, but Paul wouldn't do it. And then, don't overlook verse 27. Two years Paul spends right there imprisoned. House arrest, but prisoned. Two years. Two years. And then he's left there because Felix was wanting to not stir the pot with the Jews any longer until Festus comes into the leadership role there. Questionable times call for unquestionable faith in God. Paul maybe didn't understand why he had to go to prison, why he had to sit there maybe for two years. But God had something going on. He preached the gospel to Felix and Drusilla. We know that coming up, he's going to preach the gospel to many others and even some of Caesar's household. 
some who trust Christ. And none of that could have happened if Paul wouldn't have stayed with God. I mean, Paul could have retired. He could have said, hey, listen, I've been doing this for a while. I've been preaching, and I started all those churches. I've done a lot, Lord. And I'm an old man now, and I think the best thing for me to do is just maybe to go to these other churches and help them. That just wasn't in his DNA. He stayed with God. He, he went on. He stayed with him. And he was afforded many opportunities because of it. Friends, all of us at times are going to feel like giving up. All of us. We're all going to have those days when we're saying, man, is this really worth it? But let's be reminded tonight, unquestionable time, or qu questionable times call for unquestionable faith in God. How are we going to respond to him? If you'd stand with me, please, and our musicians would come. We'll have a time of invitation. The word has gone out. The challenge has been given. Where does it find us tonight? Is it time to stop deferring? What is it that we're deferring? What is it we need to say yes to God? How is he dealing with us tonight? You know, only you and I know what God's saying to our hearts. Only you and I know how God are dealing with us right now. And uh, tonight, it's the time to stop putting it off. And it's time to make a decision to just stay with God.